Thank you very much. Um, okay, so as promised, this uh, this last lecture, I'm going to give you at least one more um, uh, understanding derivation of the correspondence. And in contrast to what we saw in the last lecture, the co this today I'm really going to focus on constructions between on-shell diagrams and Grassmannian geometry that has nothing to do with planarity, um, so that we so we can see that this is really a truly general kind of construction. And one of them will be kind of bottom up. They're both somewhat more general than, than what I described last time. Um, one of them will be kind of building up from pieces and then I'll give you a much more holistic approach. So maybe I'll give you one and a half new pictures. So I'm going to start this with where, with, um, with really from the first lecture, which is the comment that the three particle amplitudes, because they're well defined in any massless quantum field theory in four dimensions, that you can build pictures like this and that these things have invariant, well, gauge invariant um, meaning. Um, and because the three point amplitudes are fixed all orders of perturbation theory, this meaning is, is, is a, it's, it's a meaningful concept. And you can think about this as a cut of some multi loop amplitude, but I really want to, um, I hope I've convinced you that, they're, that these deserve to be thought of as building blocks for quantum field theory. And in the, um, um, second or the, maybe the middle third of this uh, uh, lecture, we'll see how to go directly from a picture like this to a formula like this without doing the laborious work of multiplying all the vertices to get all the amplitudes together and summing, integrating over the on-shell phase space, etc. Um, and in fact, actually, it is kind of a good exercise to try to do because I'm almost convinced that any precocious enough student to try doing that, taking this function, putting it in Mathematica, say, multiplying all the vertices, and trying to get from here to here, you would probably discover the Grassmannian correspondence just because it, you'd be forced to simplify your work. And the re why? The reason is because if you tried to put this, say, in Mathematica and you tried to do this on-shell phase space, momentum conservation in four components is a, uh, is a quadratic constraint. Right, so there's actually two solutions to every three-point momentum conservation, and that means you have two to the number of vertices roughly numbers of solutions to these equations, to the on-shell conditions. And of course, you only care about one of the two solutions at every single vertex. And it, it would just annoy, annoy you that, that, that momentum conservation has two solutions at every vertex, and yet you only care about one of them. And you would like to try to automate that somehow. So just to remind you what these three-point amplitudes look like, um, this again, I'm not really going to discuss this again, but the point is, is that a blue vertex mean, is a function of just the lambdas, and it tells you, and it, and it requires that all the lambda tildes are proportional to each other. And this is just a function of the lambda tildes, and it tells you that the lambdas are proportional to each other. Actually, for most of this talk, you can kind of ignore this whole supersymmetry business. You can just consider this some part of some general numerator. It's the numerator appropriate to the three particle vertex in question. And in n equals 4 or n equals 8, it looks something like this. Um, actually, n equals 4, it looks something like this. n equals 8, well, it looks like the whole thing squared, kind of. Um, but that's, that's really all you need to know, that they are differentiated according to which they're functions of. Now, so trying to calculate a diagram like what we saw on the last page, I think that any um, moderately intelligent person would, tr would try to simplify their work. And the, the easiest way to do this is to realize that momentum conservation for each of these two solutions is linear. It's linear in the lambdas or the lambda tildes. It, it, the quadratic condition factorizes into two linear pieces. And to make that manifest, and also just to really specify exactly which of the two solutions you'd like to take, um, we're going to introduce some auxiliary junk. Just some auxiliary um, degrees of freedom. Just, it's going to look ugly for a moment, but I promise you it will be simple later. So we're going to introduce an auxiliary two by three matrix for every blue vertex in a diagram. So I'm going to associate with this some 2 by 3 matrix B, and I'm going to write this formula this horrible looking way. Okay? And the numerator, again, is whatever is appropriate. But the, but the important parts of these are these, the bosonic things and the denominator. And I'll explain the notation in just a second. For every white vertex, I'm going to do some auxiliary 1 by 3 matrix of Ws. All right, let me explain this notation. The denominator are the, the two by two minors of this matrix. So it's the one minor one, two, and then two, three, and then three, one. And this, I realize this is just a little silly, but these are the one by one minors of this matrix. So it's just W1, W2, W3 is in the denominator. And what is this integral over six dimensions modulo GL2? I mean over the Grassmannian, which 
in phys for physicists, this is very common. We write divide by vol means pick a gauge. So just to be completely clear what I mean by this, this thing here, I mean eliminate the GL2 redundancy by fixing two of the columns to be the identity matrix any way you'd like, and then just evaluate the rest. So for example, if we, set, if we put the identity here, then minor 1, 2 becomes 1, minor 2, 3 becomes B3, 1, and minor 3, 1 becomes B3, 2, up to a sign. And so this kind of general formula means that, or it means that, or it means that. They're all the same. Okay, so in both cases, it's just kind of D log. This is just a projective measure. It's much more familiar. Um, so this is a two-dimensional integral. It's, a two it's an integral over the Grassmannian, in this case of two planes in three dimensions or one planes in three dimensions, which are, of course, dual to each other. All right, now this looks like we've complicated life, but I, let me show you why it's simpler. Well, first let me show you how to get from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So here we had two, four bosonic delta functions, and here we have six. And we have two extra integrals to do. Well, look, there's two extra delta functions. It's pretty obvious what we want to do. To get from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, we're going to integrate out b by solving these equations. Lambda dot b perp equals zero. Now that, again, is just a convoluted way. It says lambda is orthogonal to the orthogonal complement of b, which is a very convoluted way of saying that lambda and b are the same as two planes. They're both two planes in three dimensions, and they contain each other. OK. So that means that b, so on the support of this delta function, b is b star, which is equal to lambda. And now you just r substitute b equals lambda, and you immediately see the left-hand side. OK? And similarly here, we have two extra delta functions here, w dot lambda tilde. And w dot lambda tilde, w is a one plane, lambda tilde is a two plane. And there's a unique orthogonal complement, up to a GL1 redundancy, of course. And so this is called lambda tilde perp. Conveniently, that's exactly the coefficients you need here. And you, it's easy to see that if you put lambda tilde perp perp, you get lambda tilde back. So, so this is, so it, it looks a little bit more complicated at the moment, but but it's easy to see how the right-hand side gives the left-hand side. And we could have put in any numerator we wanted for any non-supersymmetric version of this that we'd like to do. All right, the key advantages of this um, are that now the momentum conservation is a separately linear system of equations in lambda and lambda tilde. By the way, why is, why, where's all this Grassmannian business coming in? It's actually kind of trivial from this point of view, which is that it's a linear system of equ equations. As soon as you have a linear system of equations, it's, it's invariant under adding the equations to each other or multiplying them. F equals zero is the same as alpha F equals zero is the same as, and if F and G are equal to zero, then F plus G equals zero. So you always get a GLK redundancy if you have a linear system of some K equations. Um, and because we can write momentum conservation in this linearized form, there's a Grassmannian involved, okay? But notice that the, also the form of these things is the same between the two. Okay, now this, if you look at an on-shell diagram and you write this auxiliary junk for every single vertex, we can now build up an arbitrary diagram, or imagine cutting apart a diagram into all these little three-particle vertices, and now we want to build it up by gluing legs together and while well, taking products. So to get from a general diagram to this on-shell form, we have, we have two essential operations and then one that's just kind of pretty. So the first is actually just kind of a complete triviality, which is just a direct product, which is that if we have two on-shell functions, I can define the product of them, and this is a very simple kind of product, but the C matrices add diagonally, and so it goes from uh, GK1, N1, to GK2, N2, to GK1 plus K2, and it just adds on the diagonal. So if I have this on-shell diagram and this di on-shell diagram, I can multiply the two on-shell functions together. And what I do is I take these, this 1 by 3 matrix and this 2 by 3 matrix, and I get a big 3 by 6 matrix. Okay? That's kind of trivial. Omega is this volume form, and they just wedge together. And D, I actually want to be kind of clear. I, sh I should have defined this earlier. D is the number of coordinates in the form. It's the, it's the size of the, it's the, it's the depth of this form, it's the degree of this form, which may or may not have anything to do with the dimension, okay? Or it might, it has, it's at least, it, it, can, it can exceed the dimension by as much as it likes. So D counts the number of variables here. Okay, so outer products, this is kind of trivial. We take two little pieces, we can glue them into a big matrix, easy. Now, the harder part, the less trivial part, is what we're going to call amalgamation, which is where you take two indices and you glue them together. And of course, as physicists, we know what this thing is. I mean, the on-shell definition of what this thing is is pretty clear. We take momentum i and momentum i prime to be equal and opposite. Um, and then we integrate over 
the, D, the, the D3 that locks them together. And if you work out what that does in terms of these C matrices and whatnot, what it does is actually something fairly easy to describe geometrically, which is that it takes column for the, for the A particle and the, or the I and I prime, and it projects every other column of the matrix into the orthogonal complement of the sum of these two. That's a little bit involved, but what happens is that it takes a K by N matrix and it mods, it projects onto the orthogonal complement of this particular K vector, which makes a K minus one uh, uh, by N minus two matrix. And when you do that, um, it's from the first line, it's fairly obvious that this definition geometrically has a GL1 redundancy, because I can re this orthogonal complement is uh, scale invariant. And so there's, this always drops the number of degrees of freedom by one. Okay, so I can glue these two legs together. I will delete two columns and I will delete one row and I will be left over with now three degrees of freedom. All right, now you, I hope you can see that you can easily put this on a computer and build up a big C matrix for any graph like this. And the universal form, this thing will never change. You'll get a form of this for any graph, you'll get a volume form that gets inherited by these, two, by these two operations, a big C matrix that's generated by these two operations. The size of the matrix is two rows per blue vertex, one row per white vertex, minus one for every internal line. Okay? Um, and this should be familiar from the last lecture. Now, also because of the last lecture, it's worth just mentioning briefly how to understand the BCFW bridge in these in this kind of formalism directly, which we already, I mean, at least I told you what it was before, but I just want to kind of remind you, which is that adding a bridge between legs A and B just takes F to F prime, K and N stay the same, the volume form gets wedged, and the column B gets shifted by column A. So we can start with this kind of empty on-shell diagram, and we can add, which is this kind of on-shell function, we can, um, add a bridge between legs one and four, and that shifts column four by column one, and we can add a bridge between one and two, et cetera. I'm mostly reviewing this for two reasons. First is because this definition of how the bridge acts has nothing to do with planarity. It has nothing to do with permutations. It doesn't need to have a plane embedding or anything like that. It's just a well-defined thing. It turns out that not all graphs that you draw that are not planar can be constructed this way, so it's a little bit less universal, but it is still an extremely when you can have a bridge construction, it, this is the, by far the easiest way to generate the coordinates. And because of that, I will show you lots of pictures that look like this, which is kind of a silly way of writing this, until you realize that, that the, the picture on the right is actually a formula for how to construct the matrix. Um, and to get from here to here, you have, you, all you need to know is that, is that a bivalent vertex is the identity. So just delete all the bivalent vertices and you get the left side. Okay, but we can do this for non-planar graphs as well. Okay, a more direct way, and this is probably the last definition of this map between, um, uh, Gross, between on-shell functions and, and gross mindings. In fact, this is probably the easiest, the way that you'd want to actually code it up, if you were gonna code it up, which is via boundary measurements. And, I'm, and Alex might have something to say about this um, later on today. But the idea is actually fairly straightforward. You take any diagram like this, bipartite, or two-colored diagram, it doesn't need to be bipartite, and you orient, you, you provide it what's called a perfect orientation. And a perfect orientation is, is you orient, you choose an orientation of the graph such that every white vertex has one source in and then all the rest out. So I'm allowing for non, not necessarily trivalent graphs, but one in and all the rest out. And every blue vertex has to have one out and all the rest in. So there are actually many orientations at any choice you'd like is equivalent as far as I'm concerned. So you just pick an orientation once and for all. And then you add weights to the, gra uh, to the edges of the graph. And it turns out you, you can add, this is actually a very redundant description. It's good for computation, but it's a very redundant description um, because there is a GL1 redundancy for every vertex in the graph. Um, and so I've, the, I've not labeled every single edge and that's because I've used a lot of the GL1 redundancies to lock, to set the edge weights of all the unlabeled edges to one. Okay, so th at the end of the day, this has nine um, non-fixed to one edge weights. Okay, now there's an, a beautiful kind of story about how to fix edge weights for these things and how um, what I'm about to tell you has to do with cast land matrices and there's also an issue about signs that I think uh, that, that there's a lot of details that I'm not going to go over, but, uh, but Brenda, for example, has uh, and 
Kankau, uh, Kankau Wen, Daniel Galoni, Sebastian Franco. There's a lot of good work on, on a more precise definition of the one I'm about to tell you. But the basic idea is very easy. You pick this orientation, any orientation you, you can, you'd like. You, you pick this, the, the K sources, there's some number of sources, and you put the identity matrix in those columns. So you put, in this case, four, five, and six are the identity, are the sources, so you put four, five, and six there. And then the other entries of this matrix are computed by what's called boundary measurements. It has, it's not to do with this geometric boundary, it has to do with, well, the idea is like it's a two-point function among the, the, uh, the external legs of the graph. So what you do is you, you sum over all the paths that connect four, this entry here, which is the column one in the row where column four has the identity, is all of the paths from four to one, the sum over all the paths and the products of all the weights along each path. So this one, it's one, 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 alpha five, plus one, alpha eight, one, one, alpha five. So this entry of the matrix you compute that way. And there's actually a very efficient way of computing these kinds of the sums over paths. And there's a beautiful, uh, there's a lot of beautiful graph theory to this that maybe Alex might talk about, maybe he won't. Um, but um, anyway, this is how you can go from this graph to this matrix. And in the, for the purposes of most of what I'm going to tell you today, you might as well set all the edge weights to not, zero, to not one because it doesn't make much of a difference. This will immediately give you a parameterization of this, of this matrix. It may or may not be redundant. Um, but, uh, but that's good. So this is how you can get a, now you have in parameterized a submanifold of the space of three by six matrices in terms of these edge weights. And you can take any graph, pick an orientation, and go this way. Okay. And I think this is probably the best, the, the, the most direct, big picture way of taking a graph and spitting, and, take, and going from graph to sub-variety. Now the volume form for n equals four is just a, the wedge of all of the, uh, the edge weights. And if I added more edge weights, it would be the extra ones modulo GL1 to some number. Um, and if we're looking at this in non-supersymmetric theory, it's, a, it's a, the determinant of one mi the identity minus the adjacency matrix, the edge weighted adjacency matrix for this graph. Um, the eigenvalues of this are related to the spectrum of the graph. There's a lot of beautiful graph theory there, and it's raised to a power that depends on the supersymmetry. Um, in which you can see that if n equals four, this factor doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So we've actually seen this formula now about three or four times. Um, the only difference this time is that I'm putting the fermionic things into the what I'm calling the volume form. But this form is the this is the general form of this correspondence, which is that you draw an on-shell diagram. There's some k by n matrix associated with it, and the k is the number of sources if you pick a perfect orientation. It's twice the number of blue vertices minus, plus the number of white vertices minus the number of internal lines if it's, um, if it's a trivalent graph. It's, um, anyway, there are a lot of, th it, that's, so there's some number k. n is the number of external particles, and you will always get a representation of the on-shell function in terms of some volume form of the Grassmannian that depends on the theory, and it depends on, uh, well, also, well, yes, but it, but it follows from this amalgamation procedure, and you can just write it down. And this form is completely universal and theory independent. It just has to do with the graph. Okay. So it's some general characteristics. N, the number of external legs. K is the number of sources, if it's a gluonic thing or if you have arrows there. D, the number of coordinates. This is also completely graph I I theory independent. It's just a graph theory characteristic, which is... It's the twice, it's two degrees of freedom per, verte per trivalent vertex, minus one for every internal line that you, that you added, right? That you glued two things together, you dropped an edge weight. Um, and it's easy to, to prove that this is the same thing as the total number of edges, internal and external, um, the ni is the number of internal edges, minus the number of vertices. This is the GL1 per vertex statement here. So it's one per edge minus the number of vertices. This is how many uh, coordinates you get by just this amalgamation procedure. And it has nothing to do with it, it's just a function of the graph. Okay. So the number of delta functions beyond momentum conservation is also always constant. It's always 2 times k plus 2 times n minus k, which is equal to 2n. And these two constraints, this, 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 the constraints that lambda con c contains lambda and that c is orthogonal to lambda tilde always implies that lambda is orthogonal to lambda tilde. 
um, because C contains lambda and because of this equation. And that means that, that there's always, you can always factorize this as, as some 2n minus 4 delta functions times momentum conservation. So this is the number of, in, of, of constraints we can impose on this auxiliary junk that we just introduced. Notice that when k equals 2, this system becomes fairly trivial. In fact, this thing is just a 2 by 2 delta function. This completely locks c to be equal to lambda. So for, the, for, MA, for k equals 2 diagrams, all of this C matrix business is just a really convoluted way of saying lambda. It's just a, it's, it's some 2 by n matrix, well, it's equal to lambda. Okay. Now, notice that the D here, the number of coordinates, can grow arbitrarily. It has, um, uh, there's, you know, it, uh, if I keep adding bridges, for example, D goes up every time you add a bridge, but, you know, um, but the dimension of the Grassmannian is bounded. And that means that for that, that as soon as, if, for example, if D is greater than the dimension of the Grassmannian, then some of these coordinates have to be degenerate. And that means that there's now a different kind of D, I could also call it D, that you should, be, you should care about a lot, which is the dimension of the submanifold. Just because I've got D coordinates doesn't mean it's a D-dimensional manifold. There's a, the good news is that it's very easy to compute the dimension of this manifold. All you do is you just pick any coordinate chart you'd like, go to the tangent space and compute the rank. So this actually provides us with a nice geometric definition of whether or not a diagram is reduced, and it's something you can put on a computer very easily, which is whether or not D of the graph, which is computed this way, right, just the number of edges minus the number of vertices, if D of the graph is equal to the dimension of the subvariety, which again is the rank of the tangent space, then the diagram is reduced. And what it means is that every coordinate of the graph is an, an independent degree of freedom in the submanifold. If these are not equal to each other, D always has to be greater than or equal to dim the dimension. Um, and if they're not equal, it's reducible. And I'm not going to give you an algorithm for how to reduce a diagram, but it does allow you to filter d graphs. You draw a graph and you can immediately say, is it reduced or not, whether it's planar or not. And it also doesn't depend on the theory, which is nice. And it's clear that there's a finite number of uh, reduced diagrams for any fixed n, k, and d. And that's because the, whatever dimension you care to look at fixes the number of vertices in the graph. And as such, it's just, just some finite number of graphs you need to consider. Okay. In a little bit, I'm going to be talking about G36, and I'm going to look at top dimensional graphs. And when D equals 9, these are talking about for loop graphs. And there will be something like, I can't remember if it's 17 million graphs, something like that, some number like that. Anyway, you just draw all the graphs. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so let me, so in the next, in the last half of this lecture, I'm going to tell you everything that we know, more or less, about uh, non-planar, uh, these varieties, these non-planar on-shell varieties. In many ways, they're just as rich and beautiful as the planar ones. It's just that we don't know as much about them. And the reasons why we don't know, know as much about them is kind of trivial. It's because we don't have this permutation angle to attack it. We don't, I mean, you can draw it on a plane and draw it and compute a permutation, but it depends on the embedding. So we don't have this combinatorial side, and so almost nothing is known. I'm going to tell you almost er basically everything that we do know. And the first part is basically, let's cl if classifying is actually slightly the wrong word, but I'm going to classify, I'm going to tell you how many independent on-shell functions there are for k equals 2 MHV. And it's kind of a pretty story, and it, this is work with, uh, with Alex Postnikov, uh, Nima Arkady Med, Yaroslav Trenka, and Freddy Kachazo. So the idea here is, uh, so when k equals 2, a top dimension, or nd, remember this is, this is a, uh, uh, well, it's, a, it's, anyway, it's a, th this means that, that the dimension is 2n minus 4. The, the, the dimension here, d, has to be 2n minus 4, okay, because um, it's a top dimensional thing. None of the lambdas are degenerate. So a simple exercise, just kind of simple graph theory from the previous slide's definitions, that the number of blue vertices has to be the number of, the number of external lines minus 2. Remember that k is fixed, locks, depends on the number of blue and white vertices, and n. And then each blue vertex must connect to exactly three external legs, and it's a fairly trivial exercise, well, I will, it, it is, anyway, it is a fairly trivial fact that if, um, if if they're not three distinct external legs, then this is not a reduced diagram. So if any, if any, if any blue vertex connects to three, connects to, uh, uh, well, or sorry, through, through, anyway, if, it, if there's, if there are two legs into the same white vertex, then you'll have a, uh, a, you won't be a reduced diagram. 
Okay. So that means that you can take an, a non-planar diagram like this and you can characterize it. Now this is not a unique characterization and it's also not, it's not, as, power, it's not as refined as the permutation because what I'm going to give you is, a re, is something that depends on the graph, but it will characterize the function completely. It's just going to be a little redundant. So the idea is to, to associate this graph with a list of triples, which is the list of all the legs that attach to each of the blue vertex. So there are n minus two triples. And these are unordered, completely random triples. I'm just going to, I'm ordering them canonically. Well, by my preferences, I guess. So here is vertex one, it's one, two, and three. I'm gonna write that, and then two, five, and six for that vertex, three, four, six for this vertex, and four, five, and one for that vertex. Again, the ordering of this does not matter, but it will actually affect what I'm about, what I'm gonna tell you next, by sign. So, but I, at the moment, I don't really care about signs very much. Okay, now, why is this list of triples useful? For one thing, Every one of these triples can be thought of as a little three-particle MHV amplitude, and it's kept telling you an equation. It's telling you that, that there's a little th this little three-particle vertex contributes a row to lambda perp. So yeah, the, the lambda, uh, sorry, C perp is n minus two rows, and each one of these blue vertex contributes one row to that matrix. And the matrix that it's giving you, so this again, it's an n minus two dimensional matrix that's orthogonal to a two dimensional matrix. So there's really a unique matrix to write down. But the way it's formed can be, is one row per triple. And for example, this is the orthogonal part that just involves columns one, two, and three, which is just this. So this is the one row of that matrix. Here's the, this row of that matrix. And so we're really filling out C perp. C perp comes one row per triple. And the triple is very simple. It's just the this is the uh, unique th one vector that's orthogonal to a given two plane in three dimensions. Okay, and from this, we can actually write down the, f the function is fairly trivial too. In fact, it's just the product of every little three point vertex. So here is this row of the lambda perp or, or C perp equation, and there is the denominator. Again, this is just a little Park Taylor three point involving those three legs. So we can just read off every single thing, and this is the right answer. Um, now, there's one little aspect here that I've probably confused you about um, in the interest of uh, connect, making a connection to the Grassmannian a little bit more manifest than it probably deserves, which is that actually, you know, is lambda, the gauge invariant content of the, the, the matrix lambda is uh, some Grassmannian. But the function needs to be covariant. I need to actually care about, I care about what the actual matrix is and not the matrix up to GL2, and so the fact that C and lambda are the same up to GL2 is not quite good enough to write this formula because this is not exactly in the, for in the form that I normally write, or rather, they differ by some GL2 transformation. Anyway, to change from C star, which is equal to lambda, up to a GL2 to, to, to lambda costs you a Jacobian, and so this is the Jacobian from that just change of variables. It's a very simple kind of thing, um, which is the, the, that n minus two by n minus two determinant of this matrix, where you delete two columns, any two columns you'd like, squared. Okay, so that's how you go from, I promised you in the beginning of the talk that I would show you how to take one of these non-planar graphs and write down a function, beautiful. Now, I, we still actually, to this day, we still do not know um, how many inequivalent non-planar on-shell diagrams there are for, GL, for G2n. Um, but what I can tell you in, in a moment here, in the next slide, is a basis. So I can tell you how many independent ones there are. And the reason is because there's, there's a kind of a beautiful geometric story behind this function. And a way to think about this is to actually go back to something that we saw in the last lecture, which is that a Park-Taylor, this Park-Taylor amplitude with ordered minors, you know, ordered two by two minors, is really so it can be thought of as being directly is attached to the geometry of, of six ordered points on a circle, on P1, RP1 in this case. And so this sequence of minors is telling you the constraints of this ordered list. Um, so it, each one of these triples on the last slide, each one of these little triples is thought of as a little three particle vertex, is telling you something about the ordered geometry of three points on a circle. So, we can, th and remember that this triple did not depend on how I ordered it, but one, three, four, let's say one, three, four, is telling you a constraint, can be thought of as a geometric constraint that one, three, and four are cyclically ordered on the circle, and then three, two, four can be thought of as telling you a geometric constraint, that three, two, four are cyclically ordered, and it's fairly easy to see because these two triples are both 
ordered according to the graph, that there's unique orientation that's consistent with these two orientations. So this is like shuffling in, but shuffling in with a cyclic understanding. And there's one term in the shuffle. So it's just one, three, two, four. And that means that that's what this function is, which is clearly just the normal four particle tree, but with weird labeling. All right, but again, the list of triples that I gave you did not depend on the ordering. Or rather, if I changed one of the orderings, I just changed the answer by a sign. So what if we had changed 134 to 143? Now we shuffle this, this list, this ordered triple with this ordered triple, but again with cyclic understanding, and you see that there are actually two solutions. You see, in both of these two pictures, 143 are cyclically ordered, 143, and 324, 324. So there are two different solutions, and that means that this, the geometric understanding of this system of equations is a little weaker than, the, than this one. This one locks you into a particular ordering. This one al allows you to, to, to include either one. And indeed, there is an identity that this function is equal to minus the sum of those two. The minus sign because I changed, I flipped the orientation of one of these. Now this is an instance of something called the, well, in this, uh, called the KK relations or the, the U1 decoupling um, identities. And it turns out that all of these kinds of nice understanding have a beautiful interpretation in this geometry. And in fact, the, the more precise statement is that once you've chosen an ordering of all of your triples, it doesn't matter how you chose them, but fix an ordering. The answer is the positive sum, no signs anymore. There's some overall sign, but it is the positive sum of Park Taylor's where you shuffled in all these triples. So it is the set of all triples that are consistent with all the orderings of all the, the set of all n tuples, which is consistent with the triple orderings that you wrote down. Um, that's what this formula looks like. And this tells you that, that even something like this formula here is just the sum of some permu permuted Park-Taylor factors. Um, I think it's nine of them or something. Anyway. And this actually allows us to give a pretty concrete interpretation to some identities that you might have heard of, like the U1 decoupling. This, this diagram is just chosen so that the identity that we're going to generate is identical to the way that everybody writes it in literature. So we look at this on-shell diagram and we label the triples in the obvious way according to the orientation of this. This is a planar graph. And so we, we list 2, n1, and then we list 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Um, and that means that this on-shell diagram, which is obviously a planar diagram, is just Park-Taylor 1 to n. Okay? But again, why, in, why do we have to view this as some planar embedding? We, can, we, are, we are free to reorient any triples we'd like. And in particular, if we were to flip just the orientation of this to 1n, now we have to shuffle in all of the ways of having this cyclically compatible with all of these cyclic things. And it's very easy to see that, the, that what changes say one, so now two, one, n have to be cyclically ordered, two, one, n, two, one, n. So these are all the ways that it has to be, and this locks in the ordering of two through n, cyclically. Anyway, so, so now you have n minus one cyclic rotations of arguments, uh, well, n minus two cyclic rotations of two through n. And because I changed exactly one sign, there's a minus sign to this identity, and indeed, this is called the U1 decoupling identity. Of course, there's an analog of this for, for any amplitude, not just the uh, MHV amplitudes, but at the moment, I'm only proving things about these MHV on-shell forms, and, now we're, and we actually understand this as a geometric statement. It's about how you can understand the configuration of points on a circle as being unions of different collections in different ways. Um, Another set of identities, these KK relations, um, again, this is just a, a diagram that is specifically tailored to give you the exact identity that everybody writes down in the literature. So here we write down, again, the, uh, the triples exactly ordered according to the, the embedding of this graph. It's a weird looking graph, but sh so be it. And on the left hand side, okay, so, well, I didn't write it down, but this Obviously, the left-hand side, because this is, the or this is ordered consistently, is just Park-Taylor 1, alpha 1, alpha 2, et cetera, up to n, and then beta 1 up to beta minus 1. That's a little weird. Oh, this notation is exactly motivated by uh, how Mathematica thinks, right? It's 1, 2, and then minus 2, minus 1. Okay. All right. Anyway, so this is a single term. And over here, we now we, all we do is we just flip all the betas, all these little blue vertices. And when we do all of that, this costs us a minus one to the, to, the end, to the number of things we flipped. 
And in what we find is that minus one to the n, the number of things we flipped, times this ordered Park-Taylor is equal to the sum of this, where we've shuffled the lists alpha and beta. Um, and this is exactly, this is the notation. Actually, I don't know if Claude used that notation in, in his lecture yesterday, but um, this is the symbol for shuffle. It is like a little W, but with square, with corn, sharp edges. Um, it's, you, sh you should all get to, it's a, it's a good symbol. <laughs> I like it, okay. Um, anyway. <clears throat> I and mean, this is the way you usually write these KK relations. So we've, we can now understand this. And what, we've, what we see is that while we have not actually computed how many independent on-shell functions, how many different on-shell functions are there, and I also haven't told you how many different ways I can write the same on-shell function in terms of triples. This is a pretty redundant bit of data, actually. Um, but I have, hope I've convinced you that the number of, that I can take any on-shell function for G2n and decompose it into a sum of park Taylors. So that the n minus two factorial ordered uh, sets, which is permutations mod cyclicity, is the uh, is a basis for all on-shell functions. And this is very nice. It tells you that if you go to a hundred loop order non-planar that for a, a, an MHV amplitude in n equals four, that the number of independent pre rational prefactors of your poly logarithms is n minus two factorial. And if you include the BCJ relations, there, there are, there are, there's one extra, you can remove one extra bit, but that's a not, that involves prefactors. It's not just, an, it's a, there are kinematic prefactors of those identities. Okay, so now I'd like to go beyond k equals two, and I'd actually like to ask this more, answer this more ambitious question, which is how many on-shell function, uh, how many different varieties are there? Um, which is, again, I didn't answer for the, and the two. I just told you the basis. Um, and the basic strategy is kind of a naive and obviously, well, a brute force approach. The idea, we're just gonna draw every single graph. We fix n and k. This tells us this, the, and, and the dimension of the Grassmannian. Let's go to the top dimension. So we have k times n minus k has to be equal to d. That fixes the number of cycles in the graph and you just ask a graph theorist to hand you all of the graphs that, that have this many trivalent vertices or, and this many external legs, and you just enumerate them all. And again, for the first case that k is, not, uh, k is greater than two and it's not the parity conjugate is G36. And in that case, I think there were 17 million graphs um, to draw. And then you take every one of those 17 million graphs and you, and you color it, you add, two colored vertices all the ways you possibly can. I forgot how many those are, but it's a very big number. And then you ask, then you filter them by whether or not they're reduced, and now you have to answer the question, how many inequivalent varieties are there? <laughs> okay, this is what we did. I'm gonna kinda walk you through the result. The, this is actually a lot less, I mean, it might not seem trivial to you, but um, if you have a powerful enough computer, what I just told you might seem trivial, but it actually, it's a little bit subtle. And the reason is because is because if we're looking at say G36, the dimension of the top of the top cell is nine. It's nine dimensional. We actually saw this in the last lecture. It's nine dimensional, and we have uh, whereas an on-shell function, a function of lambda and lambda tilde, had their eight delta functions. Anyway, the, the top dimensional thing is actually a one form on kinematics, right? It's n hat delta is minus one. So I need to actually, uh, so I can't just compare functions. I can't just evaluate them as numbers and say, how many different numbers do I get? In fact, I have to do answer something a lot more subtle, which is, which is, does there exist a diffeomorphism that takes me from this form to that form? And that is kind of an annoying question to answer, at least constructively. So I hope I've convinced you from the first part of the talk that go, if I handed you a diagram, that you could put it in a computer and you could get a variety out. That's the good news. The bad news is that the way that you parameterize that variety depends a lot on how you constructed it. Which edges did you set to one? Which edges, which, which vertices, how, in what order did you build to glue the vertices together? So the coordinate chart that you get depends on how you constructed it. But of course, these are just coordinate chart things, so who cares? Well, you might care if you need to, if you need to compare two different functions that just differ by relabeling or by some diffeomorphism of the coordinates. So the, although the map from on-shell diagrams to variety is extremely direct, this map introduces very specific sets of, of coordinates for the variety, which can deeply obscure equivalences. 
So it can be very hard to constructively to construct diffeomorphisms between one variety and the other. Okay. So how did we go about dealing with the 17 billion times a very large number graphs? And uh, the, uh, the first point, um, I'm going to lay it out in the next slide, how we went about doing it. It depends slightly on a couple conjectures. So I want to make it very clear exactly what, what our analysis was. But the key insight is that the answer, is this variety equivalent to that variety, is trivial in the planar case. And the reason is because all I need to do is compute that permutation. That permutation, I just compute column A is, is inside the span of B as A plus 1 up to B. Um, it's the first B such that that's true. That gives me a permutation. And if two varieties have the same permutation label, you know that they're the same variety. This uniquely characterizes every planar variety. So there's a very simple combinatorial test for any non-planar variety. I don't need to look at your coordinate chart. I just need to ask this rank question, and I can immediately identify whether two varieties are the same. All right. Now that just is kind of a triviality, but until you realize that for a planar graph, well, planar graphs, if you start cutting stuff, eventually you'll hit a, a non-planar graph. If you cut stuff, you'll hit a planar one. So let me just let me start with some definitions and conjectures. Um, OK, so we already saw this definition. A diagram is reduced if the dimension of the, of the, of the, sp the, the variety is, is equal to the D of the graph. And again, this thing can be computed in a chart-independent way. It's just the rank of some tangent space matrix. Um, OK, now two varieties are isomorphic if, if there exists a volume-preserving diffeomorphism between them. So if the coordinate charts are actually the same. Um, now, conjecture. Yeah. So the varieties are in Grassmannian. Yeah. They can coincide, and they can uh, uh, live in different places, but still uh, can be isomorphic. Yes. Uh, so these are these are varieties. Uh, I'm not actually sure if the if they're if, if this is extra structure or not, but I kind of I think about about these as being encoded by a pair: this the d alpha the the volume form and the geometry. I, they, they're they're probably actually the same. Um, I mean, they're probably redundant information. So I might be just asking whether or not the geometries are isomorphic. So, so what I'm saying is that uh, really, uh, your notion of isomorphism uh, probably is, uh, uh, is not quite good, because uh, you can have two guys that are completely uh, different, uh, located in different places, ah. that, should be co that should be count twice. Ah. Uh, but uh, you would like to have a isomorphic uh, ah, around the, them once. This, that is a fantastic point. Um, that is a fantastic point. Uh, and I hope I will get to a, actually I don't know if I've got the graph that, that illustrates this. But um, yeah, when's the best time to remind me about this point? But, but, but exactly, so uh, I, w I would consider the geometries isomorphic. But in terms of counting, if I wanted to, if I was looking at some structure, I might want to count it twice. I might not want to delete. Uh, th I know there's exactly there's one instance in this in G36 where this is a, plays a huge role. So, um, and if I remember, I will come back to this. That's a very good point. Okay, but at the moment, I'm just going to talk about different how many different geometries are there, um, whether or not they're located in the same place inside the Grassmannian. I'm just going to that. <coughs> And so the conjectures, and these are well, all well tested. I mean, what I mean by this is that it is provably true in the planar case. Every statement I'm going to make is provably true in the planar case. And some of these things we literally tested against all of our data. So it's, it's true exhaustively by exhaustive construction in G36. And it's probably, and I, but I don't have a proof for it. So the first statement is that two varieties are isomorphic if and only if their diagrams are related by a sequence of moves, the square moves and the merge. And also same with the white diagrams. So these square moves corresponds to a cluster coordinate mutation. It's, an, it's a subset of cluster coordinate mutations. And it's actually, it's kind of surprising that, that a two non-planar varieties might be related by a sequence of just the simple, uh, this restricted class of cluster coordinate mutations. But it's, it, it is exhaustively true for G36. Yeah. So I yeah. understand correctly that if they are uh, if they are related by square moves, yep. then, then, then uh, geometrically they can side. Yes, absolutely. So that's your uh, Yeah, so yeah, you're right. It's, it's only in one direction that it's not obvious. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. 
so the next one, and this is where this, this is just a definition, but hold on a second. So, so first is that the, the, the definition of the boundary strata of uh, or the, what you mean by the co-dimension one varieties of a given on-shell variety is very easy to define graph theoretically, which is that clearly it's, it's this co-dimension one boundary, so D needs to drop by one. And how do you drop D by one? You delete an edge, right? Remember the number of coordinates is, is counted by the number of edges. There's a redundancy per vertex, but it doesn't matter. So you delete an edge and you get to a lower dimensional variety. Now when you delete an edge, so you look at this graph like this and you consider deleting every edge in the graph. You know, there's a lot of edges in the graph, you delete every single one of them and, and you get a new graph and you ask the question, is the new graph reduced? Because when you delete an edge, D dro little d drops by one, but the dimension, and the dimension has to drop by at least one. And it turns out that for this graph, I don't know how many edges there are, there are a lot of them, but, but only three of the edges result in a co-dimension one gra uh, variety, a reduced graph. Every other edge results in a reducible graph. So in this case, this on-shell variety has exactly three boundary diagrams, <coughs> which we'll denote this way. We'll say that this, gra this variety has this variety as a boundary, this variety, and that variety. Okay? And again, so it's, this, is the same, this is the same definition we have in the planar case, although in the planar case there's some nice combinatorics because when you delete an edge, you, you rewire the, the left-right paths going through, across that edge. Here I have no kinds of paths to talk about. But again, this is very easy to do on a computer. Delete an edge, question, is the dimension of the rank of the tangent space, did it drop by more than one or not? Okay, again, this is kind of a trivial definition. This becomes extremely powerful with the following conjecture, which feels like something that's easy to prove, although there's some subtleties that have made it hard for me to prove. So I'm just going to leave it as a conjecture, which is that two varieties are isomorphic if and only if their boundaries are isomorphic. And I mean ev the list of boundaries are identically isomorphic. So if I have a different graph like this and I land on, and it has three boundaries, clearly the number of boundaries has to be the same, and there has to be exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence between boundary configurations uh, they have to be isomorphic pairwise. Um, okay, now that seems like a pretty mild uh, uh, conjecture, but it becomes a hugely powerful computational tool when you remember that if you take enough boundaries, you'll get a planar graph. And as soon as you get a planar graph, you're done, because now you can characterize the planar graph invariantly by its combinatorics. So you don't need to, to in fact, actually, there's a, an equivalent to the permutation. You can just ask how many minors vanish, or which minors vanish, uniquely characterizes all planar, all graphs, uh, all, all positroid varieties. And so this recursively allows you to answer the question it, whether or not two non-planar graphs are isomorphic. Because all you do is you, you, you take this graph and you ask, and you get a bunch of boundary graphs, and these still are non-planar, so then you take their boundaries, and then you take their boundaries, and eventually you're just going to get a, lot of, a list of long list of planar graphs. And now you can answer this question. You know, so this, this, become, this conjecture becomes a recursive tool for answering isomorphism. Okay, now this, this bit is just because of the way we organized things, and I just think it's cute, it's part of the title of the talk. So the stratification of a variety, I'm just going to define it, this is the graph of the post set generated by all these boundaries. And I actually used this notation in the last lecture. So we had one <coughs> points one, two, three, and four, and if you remember it had four co-dimension one boundaries, it had uh, ten, I think, uh, co-dimension two boundaries, twelve co-dimension three, okay, and six co-dimension four. So you get a graph of of, and each one of these things should be viewed as some on-shell diagram, so it's a graph of graphs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this last conjecture is actually kind of silly, but well, okay. Um, okay, so but for the purposes of, of the last 10 minutes of this talk where I kind of show you what the, what the result is for this G36, what this 17 million graphs turn out to, to do, I should just clarify that I'm, I'm, this is a definition here. Two varieties, I'm going to call them equivalent, not isomorphic, but equivalent. If they're, if they're related, if they are isomorphic upon relabeling the columns or changing black and white vertices. This changing black and white vertices is relevant for G36 because it's parity self-conjugate, right? The orthogonal complement of a, G, of a three by six matrix is also a three by six matrix. So I just want to talk about equivalence classes. So I'm not going to tell you how many different graphs there are, although I do know the number. Um, I'm going to tell you how many different equivalence classes there are. And this conjecture, I probably, uh, maybe I shouldn't even mention it because I don't think it's true. It's true for G36, but I don't think it, I don't think it's true anymore. 
So anyway, but, but we, we, were, we were kind of optimistic once that, that if you knew this graph of graphs, that you would uniquely characterize the equivalence class. Um, again, that is something that is true for G36, and I don't think it's, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical about it higher. All right, so what do you get? So we drew all these graphs. We computed enough boundaries so we could get down to planar graphs. And then we'd use this, this uh, uh, conjecture about equivalence to, uh, or isomorphism to, uh, to recursively define graph isomorphism for all the planar graphs. And how many top dimensional varieties did we find? 24. Only 24 graphs. Um, as far, I'm actually a little surprised by this because every one of these graphs encodes a cluster variety, an interesting cluster variety. And cluster varieties are pretty hot topic in mathematics. And as far as I know, nobody, no mathematician has asked the question how many different Ge ge cluster variety geometries are there? I mean, how many are there for G36? That's kind of surprising, but I, I can't seem to find anybody who's looked at that question. But that's the answer. It's 24. Let me ask you a question. So yeah. you, what do you have geometrically? Uh, you uh, have some cells uh, uh, in this uh, G36. Yeah. Uh, so and the question is, uh, are these uh, uh, aren't these uh, cells disjoint? Um, no, they're not, they're not disjoint. Um, they have overlaps. So I, they actually, d I'm thinking about them as real, as open regions of the real Grassmannian. And so there's some boundary structure that, that plays a big role in this. So it's... Uh, okay, so probably the, uh, the, 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 yeah. I use the same terminology. Mm. Uh, if you have uh, positive Grassmannian, yes. then all cells are disjoint. They are either... Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, you are saying that in this uh, non-planar cells, they can intersect uh, not only on the boundaries, but uh, uh, they can have common uh, I th uh, internal points. I think so. I mean, and that's my intuition, at least. Um, uh, so, to, to elaborate a little bit on what Albert was saying, so like in G2N, for example, the you can actually it's fairly easy to see that the in, in for the real Grassmannian that it is actually triangulated by the n minus one factorial different ordered <coughs> positive positive Grassmannians, and they overlap on codimension one boundaries, but they're actually disjoint. Um, they, they tile the Grassmannian in a, in a disjoint way. I do not, my intuition is that this is, that's not the case here, but I don't know. Um, it's a good but question. You can uh, check for this 24, you can check this very easily, yeah? I, yeah. Yes, I can. <laughs> um, check. We should check, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't expect that they are disjoint. All right, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's check that. So, so of these 24, 22 of them are bridge constructible meaning I can just get them by a sequence of bridges, very easy. In fact, actually all 22 that are bridge constructible are constructible on the same uh, co-dimension three daughter. So you start from the same exact cell and you just add bridges in 22 different ways and you get those representatives. And then two of them are not. And the two of them are not, um, I don't know if I have pictures of them anywhere, but I, I showed, actually the one that we showed you for the boundary measurements is one that's not bridge constructible. Um, Anyway, um, those things you can view as a bridge constructible graph where you glue two extra edges. Anyway, it doesn't matter. One of, exactly one of these is planar. I, actually, yeah, okay. So these things are one forms on the space of leading singularities of, of, of you know, I remember uh, I, it's an eight dimensional variety corresponds to a function, an on-shell function, not a form or a, or a delta function. N hat delta equals zero means that D equals eight, not nine. And that means that these things can be viewed as these forms, if you think about it using, doing Cochise theorem on them, gives you an identity among the eight dimensional ones. And these 10, so it turns out there are exactly 10 equivalence classes of co-dimension one boundaries. And these are the coefficients, these are the analogs of the R invariants that will appear as the coefficients of polylogarithms to all loop orders. And although there are 10 equivalence classes of them, it turns out that only three of them are independent. They're ident all of these 24 give you relations among these 10. And, um, and in the paper uh, with Kung Kao Wen and uh, Daniel Galoni and Sebastian Franco, we enumerated all of the, the uh, identities that are in given. And I think there are, 
I think I'd give the number here. So there are 3,000 distinct functions among the 10. You might, be, you might have thought it was higher because it's 10 times 6 factorial times, times, times 2 for parity. But there's only 3,000 distinct functions, and they're spanned by, f uh, by 434 independent ones. So that's the size of the basis. They were three classes. There are seven uh, uh, co-dimension uh, two, six co-dimension that. These numbers uh, look conspicuous, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Prime, I'm just telling, I mean that it's not, a, uh, it's not, that it's a connected graph. Okay, so let me just draw you the picture. So here are the 24 equivalence classes. All right, anyway, and they all, they, uh, a friend of mine commented that they look like fret, you know, like a tab tablature, kind of, if you play guitar. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, but you notice that the kind of the bottom core is the same for all these graphs. So it's, it's just a sequence of three bridges. They're all very easy to construct. It's very easy to, to, to prove that they're all independent. And we claim by exhaustion, by brute force exhaustion, that this is the complete list of inequivalent varieties, subject to that important conjecture that two varieties are isomorphic if and only if their boundaries are isomorphic. <coughs> now for the one graph, now I, I, fortunately I didn't draw the graphs in the non, so this means the graph like this where you glue A and A prime together. Um, and unfortunately I, I'm sorry for drawing it this way. But in this particular case, this is the one that I drew earlier for the boundary measurement uh, example. Um, it, it does come up, uh, address the, the uh, um, Professor Schwartz's earlier question, which is that in this case, it has 12 boundaries which come in six equivalent pairs. And so it's, it's, it's actually very interesting that if you look, you delete one edge of this graph that the, and another edge of the graph that they're actually move equivalent. And it forces, so you, it begs the question whether or not the boundary is this thing twice, or is it, uh, it once, or what? And I think the only legitimate answer to this is that it's this thing twice. And because there's exactly one square move relating one graph to the other graph, that they're oppositely oriented. And they're actually in different positions inside the Grassmannian. So even though they're equivalent, they're located in different places and they're oppositely oriented. Um, but, I, but I'm still kind of wrapping my mind around the, the possibility that, that there are equivalent graphs located in different places, which uh, does not happen in the planar case. Okay, so here are the 10 functions. I'm just gonna, I only have a couple more minutes, so I'm just gonna just kinda show you the, the pictures. This is the R invariant. You might remember this from the last lecture. You might remember it from Uton's lecture. This is the, the, the piece that gives you the NMHV tree amplitude, and it's just the planar on shell diagram. Um, these ones are a little weird, but one, two, and five, five is uh, the weirdest one on the whole list, um, generate all of them. So if you knew just this function, that function, this function, and all of their permuted friends, you would be able to construct, these are, that is a complete list of coefficients you need for all loop orders. Um, okay, and I'm gonna skip over those. So I'm gonna end this, this series of lectures kind of where I started it, which is that I, that I hope I've illustrated now in enough different ways that, there, that there's a beautiful and rich correspondence between this class of functions, which I think physicists which are, were motivated from physics point of view independently before we knew anything about this correspondence because they were, they were useful for computing amplitudes um, on shell functions. But there is, is a correspondence between these things and some beautiful geometric structures inside the Grassmannian. And this allows us to, uh, it raises some important questions and it allows us to start tackling them even if by silly things like brute force construction. I mean, that I think there has more uh, fuel in it if we wanted to go further. Um, but I'm hoping that eventually somebody is going to tell me that there's a combinatorial, re that there's a, a simple way to count that number 24 and that doesn't involve drawing 17 million graphs. Um, and, uh, and I think that there probably exists some nice story, but I don't know what, yet, what that looks like. So thank you very much. And uh, um, yeah, and please buy this book. Thank you.